week on Talk Asia, we're in Munich for a special in-depth interview with Malaysia's former Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. This is Talk Asia. Change your perception. And I know what works. And there's a magic. I'm not sure. That's a single sound. We are what we are today. That's the problem with that. We do have issues around here. It's time for this new set. Welcome to Talk Asia. I'm Lorraine Hahn. On September 20th, 1998, the former Deputy Prime Minister was arrested under the Internal Security Act after leading one of Malaysia's largest anti-government protests. Since then, he's been tried and found guilty for corruption and sodomy, been imprisoned and beaten, lost loved ones. And this to a man who was once former Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir's protege and heir apparent. Earlier this month, his sodomy charges were unexpectedly overturned, allowing Anwar Ibrahim to become a free man overnight. But the federal court's decision to reject his corruption appeal bars him from holding political office until 2008. I'm here in Munich at the clinic where Anwar Ibrahim is recuperating from back surgery. Six years to the day he was arrested, we're going to hear in detail what life was like behind prison bars, his political ambitions, and much, much more. Dr. Sri Anwar, thank you very much for joining us. The only avenue you have at the moment to get back into political office is to seek a royal pardon. Is that something you want to do? I will be discussing with my counsel what are the implications. Um, I have uh, consistently stated that I'm innocent of the charges and uh, I will then uh, act accordingly. But um, the judgment does not preclude my ability to participate in politics or active social life. What is uh, disallowed is only holding political positions or contesting in elections. And I think I have to uh, think and uh, go beyond that. It should transcend pure partisan politics. And that is why that does not concern or worry me the least. The reaction in terms of you yourself when they overturned the sodomy charge, five times you tried. Why do you think this was the time that they changed their minds? There was a change of leadership. Prime Minister Abdullah had made it categorically clear that he wanted a, an independent judiciary. There is, possible, there is a possibility of a changing climate. Um, some judges are quite credible. They want to assert their independence. But this initial change you have seen taking place. And I think all these factors uh, do contribute to the, um, the uh, and, and, and uh, allow for the judges to come up with this decision. Now, despite the two to one ruling, some though continue to question the truth and and this includes the judges themselves. And I, I, I'd like to quote you something that I read recently in, in, a, in a magazine. And it says, We find evidence to confirm that the appellants, Anwar and Sukma, were involved in homosexual activities. And we are more inclined to believe that the alleged incident at Tivoli Villa, that is Sukma's apartment, did happen sometime. Now, I have to ask you, you know, what do you say to that? You know, they allowed the appeal and freed me based on substantive legal arguments and facts. They then proceeded to affirming an innuendo, uh, which was uh, politically expedient. So there is therefore a uh, substantive legal decision coupled with a political compromise, which was clearly seen. Because that innuendo is unprecedented in legal history. You either deal with the facts and the law, and you leave the innuendos aside. So what you're really saying is they let you go, but they're still leaving a seed of doubt among the minds of people. I don't think it is a matter of a seed of doubt, because uh, I think a large uh, number of Malaysians understand that Tivoli Villa was not there. They've amended the charge. There was this conspiracy involving the judiciary, the police and the Attorney General, and this was clear, it's all exposed. 
And this was confirmed by the International Commission of Juries, Amnesty International, Malaysian Bar Association. Uh, what they wanted to do as a compromise is to allow for the, uh, to use a client to participate in politics. Uh, but uh, to me, it's quite relevant, notwithstanding what they said, I will proceed with my uh, belief and my call for uh, reform. Professor Sri Lanka, there's also speculation, as I'm sure you know, that a deal was struck between you and the Prime Minister. I must uh, uh, affirm what uh, Prime Minister Abdullah has said, that uh, there is absolutely no, no pact or deal. Of course, there were discussions about facilitating my departure, because I've not, I have no uh, passport. I can leave the country without uh, him or the authorities uh, uh, helping or assisting in facilitating the arrangement. That's all. But of course, I look forward to meeting him and discussing with him. And, uh, and, I, and I believe that is uh, the new sort of uh, approach towards a more civil relationship in politics. Which is what Badawi comes across as, right? His face is the kind of face of Malaysia. He seems to have pushed ahead with his anti-corruption campaign quite vehemently. Is that how you see the Prime Minister? I see a departure from the past. But I want to see, I want to see more action because if you see vehemently uh, in terms of anti-corruption measures, certainly it's not, it's not happening. A lot of uh, ministers surrounding him are, you know, uh, involved in many serious uh, corruption. Many has, uh, uh, we have adduced evidence to that uh, effect. Probably he should be given some time, but the, and then that's his support. Uh, but he must be encouraged to move on. We have, we have, we have wasted too much time. Uh, investors are not coming in precisely because of the uh, image and credibility of the judiciary, of the perceived corruption, which is quite endemic. Uh, we remove this and therefore restore confidence in the Malaysian public and also in the international community among the foreign investors. And we need it uh, critically in this country. Malaysia, I mean, not this country. <laughs> Dr. Sri Anwar, we're going to take a very short break. Up next on Talk Asia, life behind bars for Anwar Ibrahim. People power. People power. Welcome back to Talk Asia. For six years, Malaysia's former Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim spent life in prison under solitary confinement, under 24-hour surveillance, with little access to the media or the outside world. Dr. Sri, I want to ask you, how did you cope from Deputy Prime Minister, a man who was in control of his life, to having people control you? It was tough, um, very difficult, but... Uh... We have to be realistic, we have to deal with it. I was, I mean, uh, kept a very rigid regime of my life. I slept at 12, 12.30, 12 wake up at 5.30 religiously without fail, and uh, enter into a serious prayers and meditation and read uh, voraciously uh, all uh, classics and novels. But of course, uh, I can't help uh, thinking of Aziza and the children. And the six years was difficult, particularly when I hear about the uh, deteriorating condition of my mother. And uh, she died when I was in prison. Two of my brothers, elder brothers, died when I was in prison. And uh, there was so much difficult, I mean, difficulty in getting access uh, to visit them. Uh, but but uh, it's over and we have to move on. How do you handle such moments when, you know, obviously when it comes to somebody like your mother, for example, who I'm sure you would have loved to be by her bedside? I was devastated. Uh, here I was um, just waiting and uh, knowing that uh, it's a matter of time before my mother uh, you know, ends her life. And uh, and they're just struggling uh, and just waiting whether I could have the chance to just uh, see her after some difficulty. Aziza um, managed to get the permission and I went, but just to see her in the last uh, hour of her life. Did she say anything to you? No, she was already unconscious and uh, I wasn't able to contact her anymore. 